Hi, and welcome back to Digital Defense. I am your host, Jordan Robertson. This is our uh, weekly cybersecurity show broadcasting to you live from the Bloomberg News Bureau in Washington, D.C. I've been covering cybersecurity for over a decade, and uh, we hope to bring you the latest tips and tricks to secure your digital life on the show, and uh, hopefully to provide you some sane guidance uh, about how to interpret the week's cybersecurity news. Uh, we're broadcasting on Facebook Live, and Periscope and uh, Bloomberg.com and the Bloomberg Terminal. Uh, as uh, regular viewers will know, this is an interactive show, at least it's supposed to be, and uh, we highly encourage you to, um, to send in any questions. You can write them in the comments section and uh, we'll, see those, uh, we'll see those there. We want to take as many of those uh, as we can. Uh, let's dive right in. This week, uh, I wanted to bring you an update on the big Equifax breach. Uh, we, we broke some news this week that uh, many of you may have seen, and I want to talk about a little bit. Uh, this is the story uh, we published uh, this week uh, that Equifax suffered, suffered a hack almost five months earlier than the date it disclosed. There's some nuance here and some additional detail that I want to provide. Uh, but basically, in a nutshell, everybody knows about the large Equifax breach that they announced earlier this month. 143 million social security numbers, uh, that's half the U.S. population, uh, 200,000 credit card numbers uh, were stolen from, uh, you know, one of the three major credit bureaus in this country. These are organizations that collect your data and sell your data, uh, and you have no way to opt in or out of that process. It's a, it can be a pretty maddening process, especially when they have errors, or they lose your information. They lose the most sensitive information about you, social security numbers and such. The significant, I wanted to talk today about the significance of the story as well as some practical tips for a, a particular type of fraud that is enabled by this theft and that uh, that played a role in this earlier investigation at Equifax and that is tax refund fraud uh, it's been covered pretty extensively by a security blogger named Brian Krebs uh, it played a role in this earlier investigation uh, and I want to give you some tips for how to avoid that as we um, you know, uh, begin to enter tax season or start to enter, start to get closer to entering tax season. So let me just walk you through, uh, you know, what we what we disclosed here in this reporting. Uh, you know, Equifax, again, earlier this month, announced uh, its major breach. Uh, it said it became aware of this incident in late July. Uh, it brought in an outside forensics firm, uh, which is uh, the Mandiant Division of FireEye, which is a cybersecurity firm, uh, to investigate. And they discovered that that information I just mentioned, the 143 million social security numbers and other consumer data ab about individuals, uh, was taken uh, at some point between mid-May and, uh, and late July. It's a pretty uh, self-contained story, uh, and, uh, and the timeline follows you know, all of the appropriate state, uh, you know, reporting guidelines for breaches. Uh, what we discovered, uh, you know, was that Equifax had actually had a, a major breach earlier than that. Uh, that it had not publicly disclosed, uh, and that was a breach in March. Now, there's, there's a caveat there. So the company is coming under a ton of pressure because of uh, not, not just the data they've lost, but as Bloomberg also broke this week, uh, because a number of senior executives, uh, you know, have sold millions of dollars worth of stock, uh, you know, in between the time when this first breach was discovered uh, and this later breach, uh, which uh, led to the theft of these social security numbers, uh, was disclosed. Now, obviously, breaches of this scale are, uh, you know, highly significant internal uh, and material information. So uh, what Bloomberg broke again this week, was a big week for us, was that the, the Department of Justice uh, and the FBI are investigating uh, these stock sales you know, and whether Equifax executives violated any insider trading laws. Uh, really serious investigation. It may be the first time, you know, if any of those uh, suspicions are proven, uh, that we potentially see somebody go to jail uh, you know, over a data breach. Uh, of course, it's not for improperly protecting data, uh, although that might be, uh, in some cases, a nice thing, uh, you know, but it might be potentially for financial uh, fraud. But here's what I want to get to. So part of our reporting concerns, uh, part of our reporting concerns this, this report by, uh, again, a, a security blogger named Brian Krebs, uh, been around a long time, very experienced, very good investigative journalist. Uh, he had reported back in May that there were uh, fraudsters were exploiting lax security at Equifax's Talix payroll division. Uh, this was part of, but not the sole reason for the March uh, investigation that we uh, that we wrote about. Uh, part of our news was that the uh, March breach uh, involved not just uh, this uh, this breach that uh, that Brian was writing about, uh, but also in addition uh, some indications that the the intruders between 
the March breach and the current breach uh, were linked. And, uh, and it went beyond what he disclosed here. But what he disclosed here is really relevant to the show and what I wanted to focus the, uh, the topic on today. Uh, we're getting some great questions already. Thank you for those. So let me just very quickly describe to you, uh, you know, what part of this March investigation concerned, as, as Brian Krebs outlines here. What was happening in March uh, and part of what concerned Equifax was that criminals were stealing the W-2 forms, the tax forms, uh, that Equifax was storing on part of its website uh, for uh, payroll uh, processing for large companies, Northrop Grumman, uh, you know, many other large companies, Whole Foods, you know, and others as well. What these companies do is they provide their employees, you know, a dedicated portal through their intranet uh, to access W-2s and other payroll-related information. Uh, they outsource that. They outsource that to Equifax. That's not Equifax's main line of business, uh, but that's a, a service they offer. And what criminals were doing, uh, I, I wouldn't call this necessarily a breach, but it's an abuse of, uh, of information, is they were acquiring information about individuals employed by the companies that use Equifax's payroll service and entering that information into the website and stealing those employees' um, uh, W-2 forms and then filing fake tax returns on their behalf and stealing their refund. Really serious problem, really hard to protect against, but I'm going to offer you some tips today. Uh, the significance of this is, you know, this was a fraud that, uh, that all of these companies face. It's kind of a garden variety type fraud uh, that these companies face all the time. Uh, this, again, was not the sole reason for the March investigation, but was part of it. Uh, you know, and the advice I wanted to offer today, which we'll get to after some of these questions, you know, is how to protect yourself against a criminal organization, you know, that steals your information you know, and then commits tax refund fraud, uh, you know, uh, which is going to be coming up soon here in the new year for a lot of us. So I'll get to a few of those tips in a, in a minute here. Uh, but let me first get to some of these questions. Uh, first question here, is it true Equifax was hacked continuously for four months? If so, can we sue for negligence? Well, we don't have that data uh, yet. What we do know is this. We do know that the vulnerability the attackers used uh, was uh, disclosed uh, in March. Uh, and that, uh, as came out yesterday by the Wall Street Journal, they, they broke some news that helped uh, in some ways validate our reporting, or further validate the reporting. Uh, you know, the attackers first accessed the Equifax systems uh, on March 10th. That was just two or three days after this server vulnerability became known. Now, what we don't know is when did those hackers actually begin to move around the network? We know they had access on March 10th, uh, but we don't know the exact date they started moving. We just know that it was some point between then and mid-May, those attackers started moving, and they started accessing parts of Equifax's uh, systems, and then mid-May, they, they kind of reached the mother load, and they start accessing the really sensitive parts of these systems. But this question, this viewer's question about can we sue for negligence, uh, certainly there are, there are many uh, lawsuits already, uh, already in the works uh, and already in the courts uh, suing Equ Equifax for negligence, uh, but there's a really hard problem with some of those, uh, which is you have to prove damages. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons companies like Equifax offer free credit monitoring is that uh, that helps eliminate a lot of their legal risk uh, because they can say, hey, we offered these services. If the criminals are taking out uh, uh, credit accounts in other people's names, uh, we could have protected against that. It's not our fault if somebody didn't sign up. Uh, but in terms of the timeline, uh, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. But what we do know is that there was a uh, you know, major investigation going on inside Equifax uh, starting in March concerning both tax refunds fund fraud, uh, as well as some of these other issues as well. Uh, next question here is, are the executives who sold stock now going to be in trouble? Uh, well, you know, it's certainly not a good thing for Equifax that uh, the Department of Justice has decided to investigate those stock sales. Uh, you know, and part of the reason the company, uh, in my opinion, is so sensitive about this timeline and why they've come out so strongly against our story in some ways without uh, naming, you know, any, uh, any uh, specific inaccuracies is because the company knew about a major breach of its systems in March. Uh, you know, and then that breach, if, it's, if it indeed is connected, uh, you know, continued throughout the summer uh, and led to this major theft. You know, between March and July, when the company said it discovered this later breach or the current breach that we're talking about, uh, you know, that information circulates at the highest levels of a company like Equifax. Uh, it doesn't just get siloed in the security department. You know, the chief financial officer, the CEO, uh, the division chiefs, they're all briefed. So the, the problem that the company is facing 
is that their position is these executives that sold millions of dollars worth of stock had no awareness of this breach. Uh, that's a really tough position to, to, to take, uh, you know, considering the level and the scale of, uh, of these multiple breaches uh, that have been reported. Uh, so that's going to be up for the, to the DOJ to decide whether these executives get into trouble. Uh, but the company's position that the executives did not know about these hacking incidents, uh, you know, is just a very hard position to... Um, to sustain, given, this, given the severity of both the tax issue, which again was just one part of this investigation, uh, but also the subsequent investigation as well. Uh, next question here is, uh, and again, this is, uh, you know, uh, to those of you just joining us, we're talking about uh, Equifax's breach, some of the latest developments, uh, as well as how to protect yourself from tax refund fraud, which was a, uh, you know, part of an earlier investigation at Equifax uh, involving a, a cyber criminal uh, scheme involving stolen data. So if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments section. Uh, is there a chance that Equifax will shut down completely, and how do you come back from this? Well, this is a question that kind of sits behind a lot of the reporting that we're doing and a lot of the speculation around this company. My personal view, and you know, perhaps a cynical one, is I've seen major breaches like this before. We talked on a previous episode of the show about Target, and we looked at a couple exa of examples like Target and Google and companies that have suffered major breaches. And typically, what happens is, uh, you know, these companies, uh, you know, a, a good metric for measuring the impact of, uh, of damage on a company is their stock price. Equifax's stock is down about a third. I mean, it's down over 35% since announcing this breach. I mean, that's a, that's a really terrible outcome for a company and, and in some ways more severe than we'd seen uh, of penalty uh, you know, versus other companies. However, you know, the historically, and that's the only thing we have to go on here, historically the trajectory is companies' stock prices take a hit uh, for about three months. That's gen generally the rule of thumb. And then they rebound. You know, they've, they've disclosed everything publicly that they, that they can. Uh, uh, you know, the, the scope of the breach is pretty well known, either through reporting like, like ours and others, uh, you know, or public disclosures by the company. Uh, you know, executives responsible, you know, were fired, executive, you know, Equifax uh, fired two executives, two senior executives, including the security chief. Uh, and then people tend to move on. The company invests a lot of money, potentially $100 million or more in new security systems, uh, and these companies tend to survive. Now, if executives were found to have violated insider trading laws, uh, that would be a matter, another matter entirely, but these companies tend to be very, very resilient, even to mega breaches like this. Um, uh, we're getting some other great questions here. Before I get to these, though, I do want to talk about the tax refund issue that we've kind of framed the show around and give you some tips about how to protect yourself from tax refund fraud, which is one of the most tangible uh, types of fraud that uh, these hackers can, uh, can perpetrate. The, their advice is actually really short, uh, you know, and sadly, there aren't too many ways to protect yourself against this. Uh, but here's what typically happens. Uh, you know, uh, if these attacks are linked, and as we've reported, you know, our sources, some sources are indicating these may be the same intruders in both the March and, uh, and the current breach, and this may just be one successive breach. Uh, again, that's not proven yet, but that's what some sources are saying to us. Uh, you know, is this idea that hackers are after uh, your tax information? They want your social security number. They want your date of birth. Uh, they want your company information uh, because they want to hit the IRS. The moment the IRS begins accepting uh, tax, uh, tax filings uh, in early January, they want to be first in line and file all these fraudulent tax returns. The numbers are staggering. One number I saw was that the IRS has paid out over $5 billion dollars in fraudulent tax returns, and that number is just growing. Uh, and that's because cyber criminals, you know, they just file tax returns as other people, and it's actually fairly easy to do. So what kind of protections, you know, are there for individuals like us to try to protect against it? Well, I've become convinced that one of the things Equifax should be doing in light of this breach is signing people up for identity theft uh, uh, um, indicators with the IRS. What that is, that's a form you have to fill out. You can go online, you can fill out the form. The site was down today for some reason, uh, but uh, you can fill out this form online and you can Google it. Uh, and it is, uh, you know, it's basically an identity theft form. And you have to submit all this documentation proving that you were the victim of an identity theft uh, uh, data breach. Uh, and what that means is when you file your tax return, you have to you know, submit this code. You're basically given a code, and you have to submit additional documentation to prove that you are who you say you are. And this is supposed to block other people from submitting a, uh, you know, a tax return in your name. Not a perfect system. None of these are. But that's you know, one part of the process that, in my opinion, Equifax should be doing for everybody on this list if you want it. Equifax, what they're doing now is they are, uh, they are giving people, uh, I believe it's a year of free credit monitoring, 
from Equifax's own service, by the way, which is a deeply cynical, uh, you know, a move on, on, you know, in my view. Uh, but I believe they should also be offering this service to manage signing up with the IRS for an identity theft, you know, uh, uh, designator. Uh, because, uh, you know, if indeed these breaches are, are linked, uh, one thing we know about these hackers is that they were very interested in tax, you know, refund fraud, uh, you know, according to, you know, Brian Krebs's uh, early reporting. So that's one way uh, that you can protect yourself is if you're really concerned, sign up for that identity, identity theft designator with the IRS. It's a cumbersome process, but it will give you some peace of mind. And the other piece of advice is very simple. Do your tax returns early. Nobody likes to do this. Uh, we all like to procrastinate. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, the only reason criminals are able to get away with this is not because they've stolen your information. Frankly, a lot of this information that Equifax lost was already out there anyway through other breaches of different companies. The only the best thing you can do to protect your, ta protect your tax returns is simply file early when the IRS begins accepting them in early January. If you get ahead of the hackers in the line, what they will get is an error message saying somebody has already filed this tax return. Very smart thing to do. A little extra legwork on your part, but it'll go a long way. Um, we're getting a ton of questions here. This is really uh, this is really great. Please keep them coming in. Uh, is Equifax being sued? Short answer, yes. They're being sued by everybody at this point. They're being sued by state attorneys general. They're being sued by class action lawyers. Uh, you know, so there will definitely be you know, a very large class action payout in this. You know, as an individual, the amount you would expect to, to receive is probably very little. Uh, it will be a, you know, a big day for the plaintiff's attorneys. Uh, but you, know, you don't lose data like this when your job is to protect this data. Uh, you know, to, to use the, uh, you know, the Twitter spheres uh, phrasing, you know, you have had one job, Equifax, and uh, and they failed, uh, you know, at that. Um, next question here is: Can anyone tell me why there were, why they were after payroll and W two data? The intentions. Well, as I just mentioned, uh, you know. This data can be used simply your social security number, your birth date, and your name can be used to file fraudulent tax returns in your name. If, however, you also got W-2 data and payroll information, it just makes that process easier. Uh, it's just another way to get this same information, uh, you know, to file these tax returns. It's very simple. Uh, the idea that somebody would want to file your taxes for you is kind of like very counterintuitive, uh, but they're not filing a real return. What they're filing is a fraudulent return to maximize the refund, uh, taking the refund, and sticking you with the bill. So it's it's very important to know there aren't a lot of good systems for monitoring this. Your best defense, file your tax return early, and if you're really concerned about it, file an identity theft designator with the IRS and get that special indication on your file. Very important things to know. Uh, if my name came up as may not be affected on Equifax's website, how should I treat that? Should I still be nervous? My advice is uh, that website has been terrible uh, since the day it launched. It has given people, uh, you know, contradictory information varying day to day. What Equifax has done is it has stated publicly that it's offering its year of free credit monitoring uh, to any U.S., uh, you know, uh, any U.S. person, uh, not just the people who are affected. So I would say click through that warning or that, um, you know, that kind of rejection and sign up for the service. You will get a year of free service. Uh, through Equifax. I'm a big advocate of these services. I think, uh, you know, it, uh, it empowers you as a consumer. Uh, you know, just the more data, the, the better about criminals, you know, accessing your accounts, even if it, that's not what this attack was about. And we're still trying to sort through what exactly this attack was about. Um, tons and tons of questions. This is really excellent. Are we any closer to figure out who the hackers are? Another interesting question, uh, you know, as per public data, we're obviously doing a lot of reporting on this and we have some more to come soon, but, but what I can say so far, you know, based on publicly available information, is that, you know, this information has not shown up anywhere on the dark web. And that's one of the key indicators that investigators look for when they're investigating a breach. You know, if you're a cyber criminal and your main motive is profit, you're gonna wanna turn this data quickly, uh, especially the credit card numbers before, uh, you know, in that case, before the credit cards get revoked. This information, as far as we can tell, hasn't shown up on the dark web at all. Uh, one reason for that may be the hackers may see their credit card numbers and just move it to the side and say, you know, that has a really short shelf life, uh, you know, but we're going we're gonna to out ourselves if we put that out there. Social security numbers and things like that, these things don't change. So they can sit on that data and wait. So they may be cyber criminals, uh, you know, but they may also be state sponsored. We just simply don't know yet. But the fact that it hasn't appeared on any dark web forum uh, suggests that it may be one or the other, uh, which potentially is very troubling because if this data falls in the hands of nation states, you know, what that means is they're not going to be doing tax refund fraud. Uh, they're not going to be opening credit accounts in your name. What that means is, you know, a, a foreign, uh, you know, a foreign nation will be compiling and adding to its intelligence dossiers on Americans. Uh, next question here is, maybe it's time to find an alternative to social security numbers, right? 
Absolutely. Like, we have some visibility into this. The problem is the Social Security number has become our de facto kind of ultimate identifier here in the United States. And it doesn't need to be that way. It's just kind of evolved that way. I had some very interesting conversations not too long ago with security executives at some of the major health insurance companies. And what they're trying to do, because their data is actually shared pretty widely, when you think about what it takes to actually get a medical procedure here in the United States, uh, the number of providers involved in, in providing that service uh, is, yeah, I mean, it can be dozens of people, dozens of entities. So that ensures information about you, your patient data, is being shared with potentially dozens of entities for one procedure. Uh, so these insurance companies are trying to move to an alternative identifier, a made-up number for that purpose, or a number that changes, uh, but which all the entities agree on. Uh, they're moving very hard uh, to do this uh, because the problem is if your social, companies don't want to have your social security number. Outside of companies like credit bureaus, I mean, this is like, this is really radioactive for companies for this very reason. Google does not want your social security number, or if it has it, it wants to have it in a way that cannot be stolen, uh, because when it's stolen, it leads to things like these, and it leads to potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars in, uh, in, in hundreds, of, hundreds of millions of dollars, rather, in fines. So yes, there are many smart people talking about this idea of, you know, should there be an alternative for social security numbers? Uh, the fact that there isn't right now, uh, you know, just means that com more companies haven't uh, gotten on board with that. Uh, what repercussions will upper management face and who could bring criminal charges? Uh, well, getting back to, you know, this story that, uh, you know, the Bloomberg broke, you know, this week, it'd be the DOJ. I mean, it would be uh, the Department of Justice investigating alongside the Securities and Exchange Commission, which, by the way, itself acknowledged today it was hacked in, you know, a, a, I presume a separate breach. Um, you know, but it, these would be federal uh, U.S. entities you know, potentially, we have to say potentially, these investigations have just begun, you know, bringing charges for, you can't dump stock as a company executive when you know your company has been hacked and you know there's an investigation ongoing. And these investigations can go anywhere. That's part of the problem with investigating these breaches is uh, you never know where they're going to wind up. You might find one little indication on one small server somewhere that an attacker's got in. That could be the most sophisticated hacker in the world that got to, you know, to the crown jewels of your network. And in this case, these hackers did get the crown jewels jewels of Equifax. Now, that may be because they were the most skilled attackers in the world, we just don't know, or Equifax may have been lax uh, in its security. Uh, but in terms of you know, potential criminal charges, the only real place I could see it you know, potentially happening is with the stock sales. Nobody goes to jail for causing a data breach. Uh, you know, but again, depending on the type of, and the nature of the data breach, uh, you know, I mean, that may be something uh, you know, that we might see in the future, but probably not for this case. Equifax, here's another question. Equifax operates in more than just the U.S. Did this affect only Americans or should citizens from other countries be concerned as well? Good question. Uh, this also affects individuals from other countries. Uh, as far as we know now, uh, U.K. citizens have been affected as well. Uh, and I'm not sure about other countries, frankly. Uh, but we do know that Equifax is a worldwide organization. Their presence abroad is not as large uh, as it is in the U.S. Uh, but there were Europeans affected uh, as well. But it does appear that the majority of the information that was stolen, 140 43 million uh, consumer data profiles. Equifax was very specific at those involved U.S. persons. And one other thing as well that I think is important, I've been covering this for a long time, as I you know, often state, uh, you know, you have to learn how to read some of these company statements. And it, while they may be like truthful to the, the letter, uh, there may be other things to kind of interpret from them. When Equifax says that as many as 143 million social security numbers may have been stolen, uh, you know, we, ha we have to assume that that is an accurate statement. However, that doesn't mean that the other you know, 140, 150 million social security numbers that they have weren't taken. It may just mean they don't have evidence it was taken. That's a really important distinction in reading these these press releases from companies about cybersecurity breaches. You've got to read them with a very discerning eye uh, because companies will only acknowledge what they can prove was taken or accessed. That's a very important legal standard that they have to meet. It does not mean the other data wasn't accessed. It may be. They may just not have accessed. They may just not have evidence that it was accessed. Uh, so I would just assume that you know, if you have a social security number uh, and you're a U.S. person, uh, that you were, you were compromised. That's probably just the safe way to operate. Um, Next question here. Again, we've gotten some amazing questions. Thank you so much for, for your engagement on the show. Uh, you guys are always great about uh, asking good questions. If there's a class action lawsuit, how much would people really get? Yeah, I don't know the answer to this question, but you know, generally, again, like 
I like to look at history and say, what does history tell us you know, about how much people get? It's generally very, very little. I would not plan your retirement <laughs> around getting uh, some major check from Equifax. Uh, you know, it can range from a few pennies to a few dollars. You know, who knows? Uh, but if you're talking about 143 million people, uh, you know, potentially, uh, you know, affected, let's say the settlement is 200 million. You know, you might get, <laughs> you might get two bucks uh, or less. Uh, so I wouldn't expect it to be very much. The plaintiff's attorneys, they always make out great in these cases. Uh, this is kind of a slam dunk case. Equifax was supposed to protect this data. It didn't, uh, you know, and anybody who was affected uh, and signed up for these lawsuits will probably get, you know, some small token uh, from the company. Uh, but with that, we need to wrap up. Again, I really want to thank everybody for watching and for participating in this show. Uh, you know, we, we hope we're, we're teaching you, you something and, uh, and telling you something you may not have known. This is an evolving story. It's very fast moving. We're obviously doing a lot of reporting around it, and we're going to have some stories soon uh, that I, I think people will be interested in. Uh, but for now, we'll sign off. Thank you for watching Digital Defense. We broadcast every week, uh, noon Eastern, from the Bloomberg News Washington, D.C. Bureau. Uh, you can check us out when the show is done at Bloomberg.com slash technology. Uh, I'm on Twitter at JordanR1000. Uh, and on our website, you'll see links to Decrypted, which is a great podcast we do, as well as another web series, a uh, weekly web series from my colleague Mark Gurman uh, called Gadgets with Gurman, where he reviews the latest and greatest in, uh, in tech gadgets. Was that signing off? Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you next week on Digital Defense.